This is the newsroom for Tuesday, May 18, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN, and Tarzi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, a father attempts to kill self and his two-year-old daughter. As water covers farms and roads, Region 9 braces for more floods. The government readies to send in relief. We cannot have people being affected and don't provide the necessary support for them. The health minister says, unaware of the Brazil Covian variant in Guyana. Uh, we were not able to identify any such uh, variant. GPL workers get a salary increase for the year 2020. And in sport, Rames Mohamed continues reign as GMR and SC president and Shimran Hetmeyer back in West Indies squad for T20 series. With the news, I'm Kurt Campbell. We're glad you can join us. First up, a man has told police that the burden of caring for his children after his wife committed suicide forced him to ingest a poisonous substance and feed some to his baby girl just after midnight on Monday. Police said they are investigating the circumstances surrounding which the man ingested a poisonous substance and attempted to pour some in the tea of his two-year-old daughter. The man from the east coast of Demerara along with his baby girl were admitted to a medical facility and their condition is listed as stable. The couple had two other children aged one and four. The man told police that he had also intended to feed the other two children the poisonous substance. The man also told police that after his wife died, he just could not cope with raising the children. A number of farms and roadways across Region 9, Upper Takatu, Upper Essequibo, have been affected by the seasonal flooding and the region is bracing for worse in the coming weeks. Regional Chairman Brian Alicock said Tuesday. Speaking to the newsroom via telephone from his Letem office, Alicock said that the communities in the South Rupununi have been affected since Sunday. On Monday, however, the floodwaters began spreading to the North Rupununi. We can see, as you can see, what is happening here. Um, especially those who are living in, in low areas have to be um, on the alert. They have to um, go to safety areas now because of the, the water keep rising, as well as the, um, the farmers. They, they, they're going to be affected by the, um, the, the water because a lot of the farmers, they, 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 they farm in the um, low areas. So that is one of the major problems every, every rainy season. To tell you the truth, it's not really affecting me at the moment because it's still possible. Um, however, being working with the Regional Democratic Council and also being a part of the disaster preparedness um, team, um, it would appear that from this morning, check that the water would have been slowed down um, at the rate as which it, would, which it was being ra has been raising for the past two days. So that is a good sign. Um, if this keeps up, uh, by the end of today, um, we should see the water start receding. However, if the water, if that pattern change, therefore by tomorrow it's going to be a bigger headache for most residents since you have only transportation in and out of the village would be both. I would like to see the help now, people. This this water will destroy now people, you know. I would like to see the help them you know, to be to build up or the, the build up more bridge, the the, the road more high, you know, so they cannot so how people would come pass free not touching the water, you know, because this water this water by the ship itself will pass by the ship, it will pass the road we are going to let them, it will pass over the let them. By Tajun, the all the households, um, the farms are under water. Um, Parbar has experienced some flooding. Their farms on the water, Sun Creek, and now this morning I get another um, thing, Upper Terry in the North Rooney. They are experiencing um, flooded waters in the farms, Upper Terry River. And I know by this afternoon, Crosswater can call me. Um, those were the, um, and Mokomoko called me yesterday and said all the cassava are rattling. Um, so they require some. Uh, equipment to process the cassava. Them. So now this morning, um, 
the rain, the rain, the water has covered the access to St. Ignatius, both ways, top and bottom. And um, in the Tapachinga area, some houses we know will go underwater um, soon. So. Okay. The farms are underwater, and most of the farmers plant cassava to make farine and make cassava bread for a living. So most, they, most, most likely is only the cassava being affected. And when that happens, when flood comes, the cassava, the, it, it, it needs to reap. Uh, some, some, sometimes some, some um, you know, they have some young cassava, so that goes to be it. The regional chairman said that regional officers were conducting a full assessment of the flooding in the region, and if necessary, he said that plans are being put in place to relocate families to shelters across the region and to provide food assistance and sanitization supplies through the Civil Defense Commission CDC. He said that it is possible that flooding can increase in the coming weeks. Water started to recede in the south, but um, we're not taking that because this is the first set of water coming. We have three phases of water that would normally come in to the region. So this is the first phase, and this water that is coming is mainly from the backflow of um, the Amazon into the Rio Negre, into the Rio Branco, and then into Takato Erie. Okay. So that is the water that is coming in now. On Monday, the CDC said that it is closely monitoring seasonal flooding that has affected several areas in the Region 9 area, and it stands ready to deploy resources and personnel if necessary. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Vishani Ragabir. Meanwhile, the Civil Defense Commission on Tuesday began mobilizing relief supplies for the residents of Region 9 affected by the flooding. An assessment of the needs of residents is ongoing, but in the interim, 1,000 amperes of food and cleaning supplies are being prepared to be sent to the region. We are at this moment, in terms of how many we're catering for, we have a total of like about a thousand hampers that we this on this first a thousand hampers that we send on this first load. And that catered for a family of like about five to six persons per household. It's sometimes a bit ticklish in terms of determining the period, but we will have a sustained response to the region. We cannot have people being affected and don't provide the necessary support for them. And we have um, adequate relief supplies available, as you would have seen within the warehouse facilities. And once uh, there is, uh, the road is give us the necessary um, service so that we can take it through the trail, we'll take in. But we also make provision to do some amount of procurement within the regions to at least support the local economy within the regions to provide supplies to the communities, the outlying communities. Despite indication from the Pan-American Health Organization PAHO's advisor on emerging viral diseases, Dr. Jairo Mendes Rico, that the Brazil P1 variant is in Guyana, Minister of Health Dr. Frank Antony has said that the local authorities have not been able to confirm this. As I've said before, we don't know what are the different types of variants, if there are any, that is circulating in Guyana because from the limited amount of gene sequencing that was done on 10 samples, uh, we were not able to identify any such uh, variant like P1 or any one of the others. Uh, so this is really news to, to us. Um, I have since asked uh, PAHO for a report um, pertaining to this um, disclosure and um, we are awaiting their PAHO's response. Because getting genetic sequencing is not an easy process and we continue to um, try to work with agencies that can get this done for us but so far we have not succeeded in, in 
getting um, samples to these agencies. During a recent webinar on SARS-CoV-2 variants organized by PAHO for journalists, Dr. Mendes Rico stated that 37 countries in the Latin America and Caribbean LAC region have confirmed the presence of one or more variants of concern. SARS-CoV-2 is the novel coronavirus that causes the disease COVID-19. While Dr. Mendez Rico illustrated the distribution of the variants in countries in the LAC region on a table, it was shown that the P1 variant, which originated in Brazil, has been confirmed in Guyana. When the newsroom returns, a teen confesses to stabbing another teen in seeking revenge for his brother. You're watching the newsroom. A 19-year-old laborer on Tuesday confessed to fatally stabbing 17-year-old Clive Osborne during a fight at a shop at Supernam on the Essequibo coast on June 2, 2019. Richard Harachan, formerly of Supernam, appeared before Justice Navindra Singh at the Saudi High Court for murder but opted to plead guilty to the lesser count of manslaughter. Sentencing was deferred until June 2nd when a probation report will be presented in court. According to reports, on the day in question, Osborne was socializing with his friend at a shop when he was confronted by Haru Chan. Haru Chan took out a knife from his waist and stabbed Osborne several times to his abdomen, chest and forehead. The injured man then ran out of the shop and fell down. He was taken to the hospital by his cousin, but was pronounced dead on arrival. When arrested, Haru Chan handed over the murder weapon to the police. He also told investigators that Osborne had an old grievance with his younger brother. The Guyana Power and Light will soon take steps to pay some 750 employees of the company a 5% salary increase for 2020. In keeping with an agreement reached with the workers' representative body, the National Association of Agricultural, Commercial and Industrial Employees, NASI. The agreement was signed on Tuesday at the Ministry of Labour between the two parties after almost a year of negotiations on the matter. The Guyana Power and Light will have to utilize some $200 million of its funds to pay over 700 employees of the company a retroactive salary increase of 5% for 2020. It comes weeks after employees of GPL stage a protest against the delay in the payment of their salary increases. According to the agreement, the 5% is regarded as a full and final settlement of all claims for increases in remuneration for the year 2020. Additionally, the Guyana Power and Light and the National Association of Agricultural, Commercial and Industrial Employees, NASI, have agreed to urgently consider the proposals for a revised collective labor agreement for the period 2021-2023. Initially, the Guyana Power and Light was offering 5% across the board for three years, but that proposal was rejected by the union with workers asking GPL to pay more. Speaking to the newsroom shortly after the signing of the agreement, NASI's General Secretary Dachan Nagasar explained that the decision was reached after JPL's financial position was considered by the union. He said the negotiations also saw the two sides agreeing on a range of additional fringe benefits for meals, traveling and out-of-town allowances, which will be payable from 2021. Uh, we, will, we are continuing to negotiate and discuss 2021. To 2023. Uh, there is some fringe benefits that we have already agreed to, which will be implemented from 2021, but we haven't signed that agreement as yet. So as soon as we finish those discussions and, and get to an agreement, we will be here again. And hopefully we could get it started out as early as possible. In welcoming the amendment to the 2001 Labour Agreement, Nagasar said he hopes that the negotiations to take place on the three-year agreement will conclude expeditiously. At the March 22, 2021 meeting, the union had asked a GPL to pay workers 7% for 2021 and 9% for 2022. Meanwhile, the Guyana Power and Light's Deputy Chief Executive Officer Renford Homer said GPL, like the union, was happy with the achievement. He acknowledged that the prolonged negotiations had resulted in frustration among the staffers who are represented by NASI. Remember that whilst we obviously want to honor and respect the fact uh, that there are expectations by our colleagues premised on inflation and all the things that we saw obtained last year, we still have to balance that with what is the company's financial position. And of course, you know, we've had our own challenges at GPL, um, you know, during last year and they continue into this year, where I think it is no secret that the, the pandemic has affected to some extent the livelihood, livelihoods of many. And so whilst we continue to deliver a service, of course, we have high expectations that for those who receive the service, 
uh, they would respond to their bills in a very positive way because that's the main driver um, towards GPS income and how we set about basically managing our operating expenses, which include things like employment costs, as well as other forms of capital investment. Renford did not confirm the total size of the payout, but said, while we want to honor the expectations of our colleagues, we had to balance that with the company's financial position. He said JPL had its own challenges in 2020, having been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We tell you now that the Ministry of Education and the Commonwealth of Learning Call on Tuesday announced yet another partnership to offer free online training. This time around 800 Guyanese can benefit from training in digital marketing, graphics design, Android development and entrepreneurship, and other areas from leading universities and companies. The Guyanese can apply to pursue courses being offered by UDMY, Grow with Google, and Coursera free of cost. There are 200 scholarships available for courses offered through Coursera, 300 scholarships for courses offered by Grow with Google, and 300 scholarships for courses offered by UDEMA. Applicants must be between the ages of 16 and 50 to apply. They must also have access to reliable internet connection and are ready to commit at least five hours of learning per, per week. Scholarships will be awarded on a first-come, first-served basis for those persons that satisfy the criteria. This initiative follows the successful launch and execution of the Workforce Recovery Initiative launched in Guyana on September 5, 2020 by the Ministry of Education and the Commonwealth of Learning. Through this program, Guyanese were allowed to pursue short courses offered by the world's leading universities as a response to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on employment. The program allowed Guyanese to learn new skills and to improve their knowledge base in particular areas. That initiative came to an end on March 31, 2021. Through that initiative, over 55,000 Guyanese registered and over 54,000 certificates were handed out. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Anil Nanlal has urged residents of Clonbrook and Ansgrove on the east coast of Demrara to take full advantage of government's online scholarship program as a prime opportunity to empower themselves. At an outreach Monday, Nandlal highlighted that young Guyanese can gain access to limited opportunities through the initiative. And with Guyana poised for significant economic growth in the coming years, Nandlal said this will prepare the next generation. The surest way that one can extricate oneself from poverty is through education. Our foreparents, uneducated people, knew that long before professors and scientists and so on came up with these theories which they tested and they verified. Our foreparents knew that before and instilled that value system in us. And that is why education is such an important tool. Education is power. Is power to educate our people, is to empower our people. We said that it is better to teach the man to fish rather than give him a fish. Because tomorrow he will be able to fish for himself. What greater investment can a government make than investing in the education of its people, in particular, its young people. Your government has launched a scholarship program of magnitude never seen before in the Commonwealth Caribbean. 20,000 online scholarships, free, in a whole constellation of disciplines so as to prepare you young and old for the challenges which lie ahead and to take opportunities to take advantage rather of the opportunities that will present itself this is the newsroom Minister of Labour Joseph Hamilton has encouraged housewives who may have been forced to abandon their dreams of higher education to take care of their families to take advantage of the government's online scholarship program. 
He said too that the scholarship program could prove useful for public sector retirees who may want to learn a new skill to keep working if they choose to. So for the females who are in this auditorium this afternoon and who might not be here this afternoon, who because of life commitment, they were able, they were not able to fulfill their dreams that they had. The last 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years, what took hold of their life was husband and picnic. And therefore, they had to lay their dream or dreams aside. For those persons, this is an opportunity. I like to speak about retirees because it is important and fundamental that as a developing country, we can't exclude pockets of people. I say, as I travel around the country, that what we have done is we have made strong, vibrant, intelligent persons, females. We have made them permanent grandmothers because they retired 55 and suddenly all the children, they don't pay attention anymore to daycare. When they're going off to school, they're leaving you know, look, young ladies, your mother don't want to be a permanent grandmother. She wants them at weekends. But that is what society has done. And we have to change that. Look, we have all these teachers here this afternoon. A person who has given 35 years to teaching, maybe more than 35, because they entered the profession at 18 or 20, all their lives. All they know to do is to teach. And what we do is to have them retire at 55, and we pay no attention to reskilling them to go back into the world of work. And I can extend that to nurses, other public servants. When they're in their prime, that they can give to society. And I'm a country boy myself, so I understand and I know. The greatest lesson we were taught, all of us, we have heard it sometime, is that the way to take yourself out of poverty is via education. That was the lesson everybody drilled in you as you were growing up. And so the same thing I say to these children that are there is here this afternoon. I know sometimes schools get stressful. School get, as you say, bored. But the fact is, if you fail to educate yourself, life will not be bored. It will be tragic for you <laughs> in the next 10, 15, 20 years. I would have applied for the bachelor's preparatory course. It gives me the basic preparation for further studies since I would not have had keep. My encouragement to other young people is to go ahead. It gives you a new experience. You're being able to study with a different university besides within your country. I applied for the business and IT and also the second choice would be food and nutrition um, because of the passion. Um, I would encourage a lot of young people to come out also and take the opportunity, apply, educate themselves, further themselves, because we need to move our country, country up and we need to do it together. We tell you now that the General Register Office GRO has issued its first set of computer-generated birth certificates. The new electronic system also produces death and marriage certificates, which will feature embedded security markings, including a quick response QR code to the top left corner. Shamika Day has more. Explaining how the new computer-generated certificates work, Registrar General Raymond Cummings said that the QR code affixed to the certificates could be read by a special app, which can be downloaded by any smartphone. 
Persons will then use that app to scan the code, which allows you to see certain special characteristics, which persons who need certificates to be used in the identification and authentication of individuals doing business with them will have access to. In addition to that, the certificates will have uh, an indelible ink, uh, this is a, an invisible ink markings on it, which enhances the security and that too will the persons who will need these certificates to be used um, as a form of identification and authentication of persons doing business with them will have the information on what is what it is they are to look for. That information will be only read under a special light, which they'll have the information on how to access it and what to look for. There are other security features, which um, we will not disclose at this time, but the persons who use the certificates, as, as I said earlier, will be given that information. The Registrar General also said that the traditional birth, debt and marriage certificates are still valid and he will continue to engage various agencies to ensure they are accepted. I know that persons will be concerned immediately about what happens to those certificates that are handwritten that they um, have in their possession and for persons who have applied for certificates over the last couple of months will know that it took a, a little extra time for them to get it and because we have deliberately delayed unless persons needed certificates for emergency purposes the issuing of those certificates to allow them to have this computer generated certificate what will happen i would guess as happens with any of these sorts of documents it will take some time before everyone is allowed to or is required to have the computer-generated certificates. So I guess agencies will still take the handwritten uh, certificates. I urge them not to discard them, not to discard them, but to keep using them until that time when, um, when they will no longer be accepted, which I would average, we are hoping that we'll have that generated within the next year, year, year and a half. Persons registering now for birth or marriage certificates or those seeking to obtain death certificates will receive the new computer-generated document. Those who have already applied through the Guyana Post Office need not reapply. Cummings said that there are other security features which can be provided upon request via email at groguyana at gmail.com or on WhatsApp on telephone number 610-9394. Once a request is made and the verification process is successful, the hidden codes would be released. Reporting for the newsroom, Shakima Day. Minister of Tourism, Industry and Commerce Honor Waldron has encouraged Cane Grove East Coast Demora residents to seize the opportunity to obtain one of the government's 20,000 online scholarships. In her address at the Cane Grove Primary School, she said the program will allow individuals to upskill and compete for jobs as Guyana's economic development unfolds. Minister Waldron said the government would be able to hire qualified persons right here instead of sourcing skills from overseas. When uh, President Dr. Fanali indicated that his vision was to roll out 20,000 scholarships for the people, it is one of the, the, the programs that really resonated with me because we understand that where Guyana is going and we all know the talk of the oil and gas and how we are going to be developed. And the skills that are going to be required are not the normal, regular skills that you will um, you be been accustomed to. There is just going to be a higher level of skills and education is going to be so important to roll out these, um, to, for Guyanese, all of us, to benefit from this. And we don't want as a government to have foreigners come in to be the ones certified and educated to get the benefits of this development that, is, that Guyana is seeing even now and at a fast rate. We want our people, you, our children, I'm so happy to see the school, school, um, school girls out here and don't see, ah, see a few boys at the back. When I was going to school, when I had to start my degree, you had to 
travel out of the country because all of the programs were not offered here in Guyana. Now you have access to many, many scores and scores of programs. We're adding programs as we speak every week. There, there is going to be more and more programs added. And you have access to that. And because of the COVID pandemic, we realized that we can actually have effective learning online. So we have some of the best universities sign up for this. And you have access to first grade education via the internet online for free. I don't think there's any other thing I need to say to sell that to you. That this is an awesome opportunity that the government and we wanted everyone, regardless of who you might have voted for, who you, who your, your ethnicity, ethnicity, whatever, we wanted to say this to every single citizen that you have access and government is making available to you this awesome opportunity for empowerment, for upliftment. And it's not just the young people. If you are a housewife and you've always had a dream of going to school, now is your opportunity. Now is the time. And our population must be the most coveted population to, to, to get in terms of the workforce. And this is indeed our gift as government. There are many others and promises that we will fulfill, but this particular one is a gift that will keep on giving because it's a gift that will supersede generations upon generations. All you need is internet. And for those of you who don't have access to internet, the government is going to make available internet hubs that you can go to to get your school programs done. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports. evening when the club held their annual general meeting at GT Motorsports. More from Akim Green. Mohammed, who was first elected in 2017, has many familiar faces on his executive, which has seen the return of Hans Rat Singh as vice president, replacing Mohammed Roshandin. Azim Jafar returns as secretary while Azad Hassan is the new treasurer and Harold Hopkinson takes over the role of assistant secretary treasurer. Sunil Prasad continues his role as club captain and John Chin replaces Joel Evans as technical advisor. The committee members are Kamal Sibiran, Hanif Mohammed, Moti Lal Diodas, Kiri Griffith, and Leland Dias. A motion was passed for Ramit Sibiran of HLB R. Sibiran & Co. to replace Parmeshwara Countenance as the club's auditors. Azruddin Mohammed, Selwyn Buddy Prasad, Harold Hopkinson, Desri Lee, and Compton Beckles were given lifetime membership status at the club. The executive also appointed technocrat members in Joel Evans, Nairon Maraj, John Bennett, Paul J. Ram, and Diana Dornelius. Ramiz Mohammed's slate was unopposed. For the newsroom, Akin Green. Given the COVID-19 pandemic, the new executives of the Guyana Motor Racing and Sports Club will place heavy emphasis on live streaming events to avoid any patrons at future events. GMR and SC President Ramas Mohammed made this disclosure after being elected Monday evening. GMR and SC are currently suspended from hosting any activities due to breaching the COVID-19 guidelines when he hosted a drag racing meet in February where a number of persons would have attended. That event also was live stream but going ahead should the club be granted permission again they will not allow any patrons to attend since you'll be investing in the quality live streaming. This executive is very supportive and they have been, they've been play, playing a major part in, um, in the truck prep, truck maintenance. You know, we're doing a lot of truck maintenance as, and updates, upgrades as it relates to Thomas Land and South Dakota now that there's COVID. COVID is with us. We're not ho hosting as much events as we used to before. But um, this year now we, we are hoping to enhance our, our, our um, live feed and keep more um, of the live feed events and less, you know, have less crowd at the, at the arena in, for, the, for the future races. When the pandemic subsides, go-karting for the younger generation of racers will be back on the agenda. It's a major push for us, but, um, you know, with the pandemic situation, 
that we have right now. Most parents are very skeptical to have their kids, you know, out right now and then. We're, we've been having a, you know, a bit issue with the task force as well, because we would implement, we would implement these um, precautions, but when the spectators arrive and the competitors arrive, they all may not follow the, the precaution lines. So that's causing a, um, a little conflict, I would say. So for, for now, we, we put that down, we, we, we have that aside waiting, but you know, it's there and it's, something to work on as soon as we are over this pandemic that's something we're going to start pushing immediately the club president said they have been encouraging racers to get vaccinated since he believes it opens the window for them to possibly host a meet solely with vaccinated persons personally i would like that we actually try to help us send out the message there to everyone to get vaccine you know we will have this gmrc um news feed chats uh, we would send messages in, inside there trying to convince the competitors to go out and get your vaccine done in the future we would like to work along with the task force and have those kind of events with their advice of course and their you know precaution guidelines and yeah we would like to see that happen mohammed was re-elected to the top post for a fourth consecutive term on monday evening for the newsroom akim green open court the provisional T20 international squad was put together with all T20 international home series matches against South Africa, Australia and Pakistan in mind. This gives us the opportunity to continue to build towards the upcoming World Cup and to determine our best squad on our ideal 11. End quote. The West Indies head coach Phil Simmons is confident going into the summer and looking forward to the World Cup and he commented open quote. We are at that point where we have identified those who will look to be the core of the squad to defend our World Cup title. So we want to make sure the coming matches create that environment, the way we train, the way we plan, the way we execute, and the chemistry within the group. We won five years ago, so the next few weeks and months will be major stepping stones on the road towards defending our title and being world champions for a third time. The provisional squad reads Kyron Pollard, Captain Nicholas Poor and Vice Captain Fabian Allen, Dwayne Bravo, Sheldon Cottrell, Fidel Edwards, Andre Fletcher, Chris Gale, Sherman Hetmeyer, Jason Holder, Akil Hussein, Evan Lewis, Obed McCoy, Andre Russell, Linnell Simmons, Kevin Sinclair, O'Shane Thomas, and Hayden Walsh Jr. For the newsroom, Mark in Green. The St. Lucia Zooks have announced their intentions for the 2021 Hero Carbon Premier League which gets underway on August 28 in St. Kitts, Nevis. Andre Fletcher, Keswick Williams, Raheem Cornwall, Rustin Chase will be returning to the Zooks for this season, having impressed last year. They will be joined by Obed McCoy, Mark Dayal and Javel Glenn. The Zooks have 10 spots left to fill in their squad and the remaining players will be announced in the coming weeks. Captain Darren Sammy will no longer be a player. However, he will be assuming a new role of T20 cricket consultant and brand ambassador. Head coach Andy Fowler explained the changes. So hello to all St. Lucia Zouk supporters um, and Caribbean Premier League supporters. It is really exciting to be here in the lead-in to the CPL 2021. Obviously as St. Lucia Zouk's coach I'm looking to go one better. We had a really exciting season last year where we got into the final but Trinidad were just too good for us. So, let's share a little news uh, with you about St. Lucia Zouk's plans for the upcoming tournament. The first big news is that the icon of West Indies white ball cricket and leadership of the white ball game in recent years, and also the heartbeat of St. Lucia Zouk's, is, has decided that he's stepping away from playing and mo moving more into a leadership and ambassadorial coaching and mentor mentoring role for St. Lucia Zooks and who knows where he goes from there. But Darren Sammy uh, has decided uh, to step away from playing after an amazing career both with the West Indies where he led the side to two 2020 World Cups uh, but also uh, as a really inspirational uh, leader full of integrity um, for uh, uh, the island. So I've, I've loved my interactions with him. 
which have included being on opposite sides um, uh, as oppositions in world tournaments, but also when uh, we worked together with Peshawar Zalmi, and then more recently with the Zooks. Um, and we, we want to continue that partnership with Darren coming in, as I said earlier, part ambassador, part coach, part mentor, uh, alongside me. And we hope that our leadership partnership will be one that is very healthy for the Zooks in the future. So Darren, from me personally, and if I may speak on behalf of um, the Zooks supporters, thank you very much for everything you've done. Uh, and we look forward to what you're going to do in the future. Last ball, the 19th over. Sammy down the ground, four runs. Raise your bat, Darren Sammy. Raise your bats. What a magnificent performance this is in his own backyard. The National COVID-19 Task Force has granted approval for the hosting of the virtual Mr. Linden and Novices Bodybuilding Championships in Linden on Saturday, May 29. The event is organized by the Guyana Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation and will be held at the Lickers Hall. According to the task force, no audience will be permitted to attend the event. 28 athletes are set to take the stage for the Federation's first event for 2021 and they will compete in the three different segments, namely bodybuilding, Miss Bikini and Men's Physique. According to the GBBFF, athletes, backstage personnel and executives will have to observe all COVID-19 protocols. On stage, athletes will be required to stand six feet apart, while backstage athletes will be required to wear their mask and maintain the mandatory physical distancing. Judges will be seated six feet from each other and will be required to wear their mask. And with that, we've come to the end of this evening's newscast. On behalf of the news and technical teams, I'm Kurt Campbell saying good evening.